Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming over on a day when there is an India cricket match on. If proof be no needed that I don't have a bias for my own programs, I've scheduled it on an India cricket match day. So uh, no one can accuse me of any bias in programming. But it's actually pretty good to see the kind of turnout that we have today. Uh, today's talk is about, I mean, the panel discussion is going to be about the urban debate in terms of the challenges in fixing our cities. Uh, first, let me just quickly introduce the panel, then I'll come to Andreas, the filmmaker. So after the, what we're going to do is, after I'm done, Andreas is going to walk us through the making of this particular movie. This is not the only one. He's also done films on healthcare and other sectors. Uh, he will talk us about why he chose to make these films and the process of making these films. Then we will go to the film, which is about 25 minutes long. It's about 25 minutes? About 25 minutes uh, long. And post that, we'll have a panel discussion. So for today's panel discussion, the people that we have got is... We have got Soumya Reddy, who is our MLA from Jainagar. Thanks, Soumya, for being here. <laughs> Mr. Sina Smurti, IAS retired, former BBMP commissioner. <laughs> Naresh Narsimhan, architect, activist, general urban expert at large. Meera, Citizen Matters co-founder. And I'll be moderating, I'll, I'll take the easier task, I'll moderate this group of experts in the second session. <clears throat> Uh, Andreas is someone I happen to meet by chance. You'll see in the film that I've got a little uh, talking role too. Uh, so Andreas called me out of the blues many months ago and said, I'm doing this film on urban and can I just speak to you? And he came over and did some two hours of film shooting, asking a lot of questions. And I later realized he's done the same thing with a lot of other people. And then he's put together a, a narrative around this theme of uh, urbanization. So I request Andreas, he leads an excellent life. I mean, he's a Dutch filmmaker, spends bulk of the time in the hills in the north. He has descended from the hills to be with us today. Uh, so Andreas, welcome to BIC. Thank you for doing this. And give us a sense of what got you to make this film and your experience in making it. Thank you very much, Ravi. So welcome to uh, Bangalore International Center, where uh, I'm premiering my documentary series 1.7. We'll be watching the episode, The Urban Debate. Um, the reason we're here today is because when I was finally done editing the film, I was looking for places to screen it, and uh, I happened to stumble upon Bangalore International Center, send them an email, very formal, long email, and then I got a very short reply. Hi, Andreas. This is Ravi. Uh, I'm honorary director of the BIC, by the way, also. So, uh, yes, let's do it. <laughs> so that's why we're here tonight. Um, so, yeah, as mentioned, it's a five-part series about uh, innovation and development in India and for the largest population that the world has ever seen. Um, as a filmmaker, you're always looking for stories of change, and I think that there are very few countries in the world that have the change that India is going through right now. Um, I focused on education, healthcare, agriculture, and urban development and governance. And uh, you'll be seeing the urban governance uh, episode. Um, it's one of my favorite episodes as well. Uh, as a child, I was playing Sim City for years and years. So I was a junior urban planner. There are urban planners and architects in the episode as well, along with uh, politicians and entrepreneurs, about how citizens can be enabled to be more part of the way the city is run, and the importance of that once cities become too big for their own good, which could happen in India in the near future. So I hope that you will enjoy the screening and the panel afterwards, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Our system, which we have inherited from the British, spreads responsibility too much and doesn't leave people the opportunity 
to have the authority, the budgetary control and the decision-making capacity to actually get anything done. Until 2035, 17 out of the 20 fastest growing cities in the world will be located in India. Some of these cities will have larger populations than most countries. But how do you effectively govern these settlements? In this episode, we explore ideas of urban governance and how India can transit into more autonomous cities run for and by the citizens. The reason that the, the bill matters, it seems to me, is because uh, we don't have enough executive authority down at the um, grassroots levels, whether it's a village council, whether it's a city or a town, and for that matter, whether it's a state uh, government or a central government, I'm very much in favor of directly elected people who are accountable to their voters. We are all driven by the vision of Gandhi. Gandhi had a vision of village republics, where he understood what it was about, governing a village and he made a distinction between representative democracy and participatory democracy where he argued and rightly so something i believe in that it was the voice of the majority that needed to be listened to and not of representatives of the voice of the majority and that you needed to have therefore an ability that you could listen to people and act and people's and that democracy in the true senses now Clearly, in the new India, which is more, it's more populated, it's also more diverse, it's also more casteist, it has lots of layers in it. How do you create that democratic framework in which the voice of the weakest is listened to? Devolution of powers in India is not new. Devolution of powers to rural areas, we look at Panchayati Raj, started many decades ago. And that has worked to a large extent. Uh, where essentially you cut through the bureaucracy, red tapeism, different governments and go directly from the centre to the local panchayats or villages. I personally believe the same should be followed in urban areas. It should be made almost mandatory. Um, and some state governments have that, some states don't. In a state like Tamil Nadu, they have a direct elected mayor concept. So if you go to China, you're a businessman, you want to start a factory, you meet the mayor. The mayor has the capacity to say yes, to grant you the license for the product you want to make, to allot the land, give you the um, electricity connection, the water connection, he help you hire the workers and even what wages they'll be paid at and the route to your market or to your port where you want to get the goods out. That's obviously too much, but the fact that one person has all this authority means that the decision uh, for the businessman is very much easier. Whereas in India, you go to the mayor, you find he's a glorified chairman of a committee, uh, and nobody on the committee has the power either, and they go around in circles, and various influences have to be brought and bear in various areas, and finally, uh, the actual uh, budget will be signed off by an unelected bureaucratic official called the municipal commissioner. All of these things are, 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 are uh, privileging inefficiency in our local government. Our municipal commissioner would never go around the city and say, hey, that new shop is built in the road setback. Ward officer, why haven't you reported this? No, he would never do that. He doesn't want to upset the guy who owns the illegal shop. Or the guy who owns the illegal shop may own 20 illegal shops. And maybe his elected representative in the municipal corporation. So a young municipal commissioner does not want to rock the boat and start challenging the, the powers that be in his city. He's going to be transferred into another job in three years now, and preferably a higher job, and a higher job, and a higher job. So he's never going to be a leader. Now, the mayor of the city in the Indian context is irrelevant. It is the chief minister of the state who calls the shots, or the city minister. The state government is in charge of the local government, and that's a big part of our dysfunctional governance system. We need to have mayors in charge of our cities. We need to give more power to our cities and an empowered mayor. We have rosy notions about London and New York, but our mayors don't have those kind of powers at all. And the state government is loath to give that. So we need to break that and that's going to take time because there is no incentive for the state government to let go of their powers. There's always going to be a, um, a mismatch between the, the city and the state. And even in Mumbai or in Bangalore or in any other city, the state would want control 
and it's not necessarily just about funds and resources it's also about political control when you uh, have party politics coming into this more than a person representing their constituency they're representing the party and that's when you start having humongous discrepancies in decision making at the local level because i don't see how uh, like a party will know what the people want all the time right they will know in certain situations but all the time you need a system that is informing them all the time you need a system that's monitoring the situation all the time you need a system where i as a citizen because i have paid my taxes and because i love this space that i live in it's my city it's my home right which i'm protective about which i should be right i should be given the ability to even suggest policy even if all 30 of the 30000 people in my ward met and said look we want the money spent on this park here all 30000 the way the law is structured if the corporator elected by us say sorry i refuse to spend the money on the ward it doesn't get spent so we have a law which has lip sympathy for citizen participation but gives veto power to the corporator so we need to unlock this we need to actually reframe these constructs where the voice of the citizen it's a quasi referendum if i can call it that can overturn what the corporator wants to do in order to influence urban policy the citizen requires tangible evidence in pune a new app called inagrik does exactly that by reporting and documenting urban surroundings with the app the citizens gather peer reviewed data to give insight to urban planners and the municipal corporation to see where changes and improvements can be made with indian cities growing at a rapid speed the support of the citizens can lead to progressive and democratic decision making we have a population explosion where i don't think the government has the capacity to keep up uh with with whatever impacts that are taking place you know uh, because uh, pune was a million i think 20 years ago and now it's suddenly like 5 million almost okay so in in 20 years it's like one five times right and uh, i don't think the departments like upgraded or like brought in enough manpower to meet that five time a uh, increase in the population this whole material is built to to get the children on board actually siddharth has done a brilliant piece of work that is he is saying he is getting the children to observe the reality and to document it and to report it actively there is about 500 children uh but about 5000 have been uh, trained citizens who keep taking care of the city uh, will be more proud of the city and if they are more proud of the city they'll be more proud of their country you know and they'll contribute better pune is highly unwalkable in some parts and it is highly walkable in some other parts based on the data that we got and i think we got something like 500 inputs on walkability from around the city one is that the road has no footpath and the side of the road is um, blocked by park vehicles uh seems to be like the biggest problem like 37.36% reports uh came about vehicles that are parked on the side of the road that are blocking pedestrians from you know making any progress so i think we walked about 300 meters and we've had like maybe two of one obstacle which is great we look at that that's that's what a foot deep Like that's a. You see that? Wow. Like that's dangerous. If we create this evidence and then present it to the wider public, then you can push it into policy. So that's the whole exercise for citizens that they keep creating evidence to improve their neighborhoods. The big challenge is that uh, what are the various indicators of livability? You know, how do you calibrate the measurements for livability? So like this is like the first layer that we're just like we're just beginning, and uh, which is very interesting to uh, like scientists like us, you know, who are studying urban areas, and we know that we are planning urban areas for people, 
but it should be by people also if you have evidence hard statistics i think there is no disbelief so it brings people on the same platform if i get the same figures you get the same figures a third person get the same figures how can we disagree if everybody is putting the evidence on the same platform you know everybody can see it everybody sees it the debate is better it's evidence so the debate is more smooth uh, you have to agree to it if you disagree you can say that okay let's go out again let's start measuring again let's start okay let's have the debate again and if it's proven that okay this is a really a problem this is a need uh, then you can move policy faster right so uh, and the other thing is that it's not autocratic it's not one person deciding for thousands right and uh so it's more acceptable because when each person has uh their views and their voice heard and which this is what i anagric does it enables you to put up something saying that hey i don't like this or i like this we have felt the dearth of this kind of ability to gather evidence because we do um, support at least i do support a lot of public interest litigation and which many of my friends are involved in and i find that there is a lack of hard evidence and many times i go as sort of the technical expert witness you know to say things and if i had this sort of solid evidence with me i think our cases would be very strong so i think like a consumer the citizen should say hey you know i want in on this i want to choose what i what i get i want to make sure i know what vendor you have chosen for me whether that vendor say even for a footpath is the right vendor i want a rating system on those vendors i want a rating system on my administrators and you can have a rating system back on me right not like a chinese rating system i'm not talking about that at all i'm talking about just a general citizenship rating system that says how participated you are now there are many people who want to do this consciously start enabling this country and i think that that should happen we shouldn't be cynical anymore with a large nation where distances of law are large we have had very poor communication traditional communication therefore today any action of our leaders in delhi or in the state capitals get reviewed by the citizens very quickly thanks to internet thanks to facebook thanks to twitter number 2 the criticisms and comments of the opposition people they also reach the citizens very quickly number 3 the citizens can now voice their approval or disapproval very quickly therefore every action of our leaders is now being reviewed by a large number of citizens with india having the largest number of mobile phone users in the world and being the most participatory democracy in the world a lot of voices can be heard at the local level so that quicker decisions can be made At Mirror Now, Faith Souza is spearheading the call for greater accountability in India by highlighting the effects of policy on different strata of society. Faith and her team of young editors have been very successful at putting the citizen at the center of the debate and to not only challenge but also influence policy at the state as well as on a national level. concept of Mirror Now came from uh, the Times Network CEO, M.K. Anand, who had uh, sort of 
devised the concept of what this channel would be and he had decided that since there are already it's a cluttered market of television channels that track national politics that we shouldn't be a channel that tracks politics because there are too many of those already and what's the what's the need for one more but there weren't enough uh, channels who were tracking policy the reason why we managed to catch on is because we sound like the average indian taxpayer we we look at things like that so we don't really care about the politics at all uh, i don't care which government is in power in which state and in a lot of states you have different governments but what is uniform across every indian is the need for accountability because i've paid you the money i've done my bit as a citizen i've paid my taxes now where's your accountability and that i think that was a the sense that generally people were feeling across the country and it sort of echoed in people just generally felt that yeah this makes sense this is this is how i feel and i think that was the trick uh, that that sort of gained us the the momentum especially journalists who just come out of you know journalism school still believe that you can change the world if you do good work and i think that that really is the kernel of the whole thing right you you need to believe that you can, you can make a difference that you are making a difference and that will actually push you to do good work so we focus heavily on decision making on policy on legality on uh, we cover the courts very uh, very strongly more perhaps more than others uh, because that is where we believe the decisions are made that change our lives or change the quality of our lives the manner in which we live our lives one of the jobs that we would like to do is be able to explain to citizens who's responsible for you for your life and this is quality of life so yes there may be stuff happening in delhi but the thing that actually affects how you live your life is what's happening on your street listen we're biased in favor of citizens so we don't care about the political parties we're actually on the side of the citizen and that's all we care about so initially we had some parties who were not who were not so happy but they also realized that whenever these governments do good work we highlight the good work we talk about it i've actually gone on air and said thank you uh, to governments who've heard us out and made changes and seen positive impact we've we've put that out on air we've acknowledged good work because i think that's half the job as well right if you don't acknowledge the people who are doing the good work they're not going to be motivated to do it again so and once we do that then people then members of political parties realize that it's a give and take with more and more indians joining the debate it seems inevitable that governance in india will change in the upcoming decades because governing the largest democracy in the world cannot be done by bureaucrats and politicians alone it will require a lot of help from the 1.7 billion citizens as well in any system where there is a feedback loop that system will automatically perform more efficiently with more stable right as as electric as electrical engineers we say uh, we say that any negative feedback improves stability of a system so therefore the stability of the indian democracy will improve because there is there are better channels today for negative feedback from citizens than before government knows the merits of decentralization but they are scared they are more afraid that decentralization means letting go of their considerable powers in the space because decentralization basically assumes that you are going to share your power with the citizens and today government is still sitting in this notion that you have elected me once in 5 years now don't bother for the next 5 years and citizen groups are actually saying sorry we are more concerned between what happens between elections then the act of the election i have always tried for the last 15 years in, since i went into politics to make this a political issue it unfortunately doesn't become a political issue but i've tried in municipal corporation elections between for each election to drum up support for this cause uh, with the hope that people will question the current system of governance and look at alternative systems of governance and they could say this is a wrong one million we need something else but um to me i I've, i've been in a practitioner in this profession i've seen what works and doesn't work and i'm quite convinced this may not be perfect 
but it's certainly a step in the right direction. So I'm in favor of decentralizing more power to the local governments, but give them real power, real authority, real budgetary control. I think we have in many ways gone wrong because we have corrupted a lot of the decentralized power as well. We have created systems of new fiefdom. We have corrupted the lowest functionaries in villages because of the money we have pumped in without the right governance systems. But whatever it is, the fact is the more you strengthen people's voices, the more you educate, give them power, the right to decide, the better off a country is in the long run. There is no question about it. In the next episode, we explore the difficulties of healthcare innovation and how innovators find creative ways to improve the health of the Indian population. So before we get into the panel discussion, a quick summary of the kind of things, you know, urbanization is such a big issue and what needs to fix it, we can take a whole view. I'd rather go with Andreas's framework uh, as a starting point for this debate. So Andreas has themes around governance for sure, where there is talk about Sashi Tarur's independent members bill about directly elected mayors. Um, uh, I think Milind Diora and a lot of others, including, we talk about that kind of concept about uh, cities being in control of their own destiny. So there's a whole theme that there's a governance story out there that needs to get fixed. Another theme which seemed to run at another level was really citizens taking control of their city. So this whole notion that is it going to be a top-down kind of thing by which our cities are going to get fixed or what's going to be the role of citizens in helping fix this and people fixing it street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood. So there's a whole theme around that uh, which is out there. There was another set of ideas out there, I mean, uh, uh, in terms of evidence-based decision making and whether, whether data will drive the authorities to make the right kind of decision and do we have a culture of evidence-based decision making then there was this whole thing about citizen journalism and informing policy, being citizen-centric, and the idea that you can hold people to account through that particular route. So the whole theme about what role does citizen journalism play in this. And then there were a few other minor themes in the overall story. So I will actually like to start with the governance part first as we go to the other themes. So Mr. Sinwasmuthi as the senior most member here and someone who's actually held the fort at one of our alphabet soups, the BBMP. Uh, my question to you, you is, especially when you talk to civil society and inform people, this whole notion that the state controls the city uh, and therefore doesn't let go like it's happened in, and you were also active in Panchayati Raj. The 73rd Amendment allowed that. The 74th has not really been implemented. And the state prefers to control the city, and let's take Bangalore as an example, through that, uh, and one of the instruments of controlling that is also the office of the commissioner of the BBMP. So what is your view? You were there in that post. You've also had time to reflect post-retirement. Do you believe that the current structure that we have got in our cities and taking Bangalore as an example, do we have the template that can give us the Bangalore of tomorrow as a livable Bangalore? Or do we just need incremental changes to the way we govern to get to a better Bangalore? Or do we need transformational kind of change in thinking to fix the place? Your view, sir. Thank you very much. I think it's on. It's on? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. You said that uh, uh, in your opening remarks, citizens will have to take control of the governance of the city and all that. 
that itself implies that the administration, the city administration, is not able to provide the services that the citizens are looking for or they are in need of. The political structure of the institution is not able to understand the needs of the citizens completely. Therefore, citizens have to have various ways of making their voices heard. So the point is very well made that there are inadequacies in the way cities are governed in this country and that's the whole thing about the, the theme that was coming through the uh, film also that we saw. Now, citizens, cities are growing so fast that our governance structures are proving inadequate at the moment. I do not think any kind of incremental changes would be adequate for the kind of expectations that the cities have. On the one hand, the cities are growing in size. Incomes of citizens are also increasing, in at least in many pockets, many strata. Expectations are growing very fast. Therefore, you need to come up with a radically new way of doing things. Now, gone are the days when you could have one commissioner, one mayor, uh, however competent they may be, and they would foresee everything that is needed for a city. You need to bring, just as people said, decentralize, decentralize, bring the a system of administration and decision making much closer to the people. Which means that a city like Bangalore, I was one of those people who argued for amalgamating all the seven or eight municipalities that we had earlier and having one Brihad Bangalore Mahanagar Party. BMP to BBMP. BMP to BBMP. I was commissioner of BMP, but when I was asked about this, I said, you can't have seven different ways of seven different municipalities administering seven different kinds of regimes of citizen services. So you need one city, one uniform level of services for the entire area. But uh, the kind of administrative infrastructure that was required was not properly designed, I think. You know. We have only doubled the number of uh, elected representatives, but we have not increased the size of the administrative machinery so to assess them. Is not there. Nor have we, more importantly, nor have we adequately federalized cities' administration. You can't make decisions in one office of BBMP and, you know, enforce them throughout the city. You need to have maybe 10, 20, you know, smaller uh, structures which would be closer to the people and have a way of listening to the people and then making decisions subject to, of course, an overall allocation of budget and things like that. So that is where you need to go back to the drawing board, redesign the structure of at least Bangalore city. I mean, I can't talk about other cities so much. Bangalore city, certainly, yes. Right, thank you. Uh, so actually, some contours of that is in a report that I wrote, which is gathering dust. So Soumya, coming to the political class and you know, the elected legislature that, of which you are now a part of, how much time do the elected leaders, do they realize that there's a coming, I mean, storm developing on the way we are managing cities, maybe Bangalore in particular, and that, that we need to do something different about urbanization and think different forms. Uh, is there a sense that politically we need to think differently about the way our cities are managed? Is there any discussions while you're having coffee, tea, anything that something of this kind needs to be done? Um, so first of all, thank you so much for organizing this. I mean, it's a wonderful movie. And um, like uh, Sir was saying, uh, BBMP, I mean, it's it's so huge. Um, I mean, I am, of course, an uh, elected representative now. Uh, but then, you know, we were actually talking about corporators and elected mayor. And even the roles of, a, I mean, the night... 95% of probably the work that I do is the is a job of a corporator. And but, but you chose to be an MLA over a corporator. Uh, yes. No, no. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that itself is problematic. For example, we have ward committees. 
and we're supposed to have a meeting um, first every first Saturday. Now let's have a look at how many corporators have actually done that. And so just going back to your question, I think it's, I mean, it, it depends from person to person. And like, um, you know, Mirin Deora was saying, I mean, it has to be political. It has to be each and every issue. We have the BBNP elections coming up next year. Let's have a look at all 198 corporators, how they've performed. Have they really listened to their citizens? Have they really um, <coughs> done work in their constituency? based on the suggestions of their constituents. And I think, um, I mean, I, I, I don't want to really politicize things, but I think we need to really separate politics from, in a sense, vote based on the performance of a person, be it a corporator, MLA, or an MP. But as you mentioned, the corporator, the MLA expectation is that you'll fix the drains and you'll fix the roads. The, in fact, I must tell you one MLA told me when we did the report, he says, I don't even know why you're wasting your time suggesting decentralization, more wards, etc. Have you seen the crowds outside my office, want, I mean, my residence office to fix the place? Why don't you hand over the city to the 28 of us MLAs and we will manage the city? So at the MLA level, the thinking is they are the answer. The corporator is the problem. The question I'm trying to get to, I mean, which I'm seeking an answer for, how are we going to get to a setup where we have that decentralization which many crave for, when we have a system that wants to fortify the power in the hands of the MLA and the state? I think the problem we have is we have too many cooks. In <laughs> 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 <So, laughs> BBMP, you know that. Um, I mean, probably an elected uh, mayor for, I don't know, maybe at least three years will be a good idea. And, you know, in the sense, any issue, you have like so many people passing the buck, right? And this conversation itself. And it's actually confusing for people, in the sense, um, well, at least at my level, I'm trying to do as much as possible. For example, I got about 16 crore uh, grant for all the parks in Jainagar. And I'm going to each and every park and actually announcing that this is the amount that I've gotten for each park. And I'm actually going and talking to the walkers and each and every person saying, tell me how can I utilize the funds? And I think just it was actually reminding me how in this uh, you know documentary it was actually about what is it that the citizens need? Are we really listening? It could be anything. It could be footpaths. It could be parks. It could be I don't know water. It could be solid waste management. And uh, you know, Mr. Murthy spoke about a negative feedback loop. I think the negative feedback loop is huge. But oh, the state, we get more the place is not, then, uh, not getting fixed or getting stable as he promised in the video. Uh, Naresh. As someone, I mean, you know, you're one of the seasoned, I think, some three decades in this whole space. You understand it as an architect, uh, urban planner also. You've been, as part of BATF, working with government. You've been an activist on the steel flyover issue, etc. You've seen it from different angles. You've also heard all the standard arguments about what we believe is the way ahead. And someone will say, MPC, you implement, the place will get fixed. Somebody said, do the ward committee properly, the place will get fixed. How do you read this whole place? And this whole issue about if there is going to be transformational change required, as Mr. Murthy mentioned, what are the contours of that? Because I know you also believe in that kind of transformational change requirement. What would be the contours of such a change? How do you see this whole thing? Because you've seen it from different angles. There are actually uh, two aspects to this. One is that I think um, when uh, in the reorganization of states itself, the idea of putting the capital of a state as also the biggest city of the state is a fundamental error. Right? The United States seem to have avoided this uh, mistake by, I mean, for instance, New York is not the capital of New York. And Albany is the capital of New York, or Los Angeles is not so the, the capital. So the answer is to keep the politicians in some other city. No, the pro <laughs> no not that way. What I mean is that the, if the center of the center of power of the state is conf is conflated with the economic powerhouse of that state also. And Bangalore is an un unique place because 30 kilometers south of us is Tamil Nadu, 40 kilometers north of us is Andhra Pradesh, and 40 kilometers east of us is also Andhra Pradesh. So to put a cap capital of a state close to other states and not then develop it as a powerhouse is not a particularly smart idea. 
And then we find now that people live in Bangalore and go and work in Oso and contribute economic might there or go and work in... Recently, I've heard that a lot of people are now living near the airport and going and working in, or what is that, new Kia motor in Hindupur. Hindupur. And we are actually contributing to the economic development of other states by being here. Right? So, I mean, that's just a minor thing. But what happens is that if the political center is conflated with the economic center, I think it's a fundamental error. And it's time to change that. And really, the capital of Karnataka should be the Davangere Chalakere region, or maybe even Bal Belgaum. And this is not my idea. So in the, in the time of uh, Ram Krishna Hegde, Dr. Dr. Chir, Ch, Dr. Singh Chiranjeev Singh, he actually had pro there was a formal proposal to move the capital of Bangalore to Davangere, which would have been, which would have also made the even distribution of urban centers. One of the other reasons for Bangalore's problems today is the concentration of economic output as well as investment FDI into one place. Karnataka has 26 other urban nodes, out of which four or five of them are really deserving of. And it's not that everywhere IT or BT has to happen. It depends on the economic law side of fact, that if place. I just come in there, there's something called Zip's law, which yeah. is true across thing, which says that within a context of a state, the second largest city should be half the size of the biggest, the third one should be one third, one yeah. fourth then you could potentially have Correct. some, that's the same thinking. Okay, the second part of the issue is, one is this, I don't know whether this is possible to do at all at this point, but I still think it's an idea, it's worth, like with idea <laughs> earth worth exploring, that if you can move, the, if we have gone and built a Vidhan Soda copy in Belgaum, maybe it's time to shift, the, let the winter session be in Bangalore, or maybe the summer session because the weather might be better there. The rest of the time they should be in Belgaum because only then, when the political, when she says it's all politics, I agree with her. So the politics must be in Belgaum, not in Bangalore, okay. fundamentally, one. Because Belgaum is seen as a vacation by all the politicians here and there. All the time I notice people are sitting in, when they go to the session, they're still, their mind is still here. Where they are continuously sending messages. What's the second part? The second part is that it is extremely strange for when, I think in your documentary you mentioned that 17 of the world's 25 cities will be in India. Not one city in India has a spatial planning center. If I ask a simple question, it makes this a little interactive to the audience. Which is the highest point of Bangalore city? Does anybody know in the audience? Exactly. Then so, we, we, that, that we, we, we are all part of the problem, so we probably know the answer. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the thing is that Bangalore sits at a height, everybody has heard this in their textbooks, it has salubrious climate. Nobody knows what is salubrious. The word salubrious is health giving. It's anything but that right now. Okay, but uh, it's at 928 meter or about close to 3000 feet above sea level. And the highest point is high grounds, which is why the Divan Vishwasharya put a water reservoir on top of it. Right? In the water, technically speaking, Bangalore should not flood at all. Because everything slopes away, either to the west or to the south and east. And everything, people, water should flow. If you cannot, under, if nobody has an imagination of the city in terms of its actual topography, maybe, you know, most other cities have invested in a city model and which shows and any so, proposal affecting the city, it's very difficult for a layman and it's even very difficult for even an educated person to imagine, for instance, like when I say steel flyover or maybe this new controversy like the elevated corridor, nobody understands what it will do to the city at a visual scale. There's no point seeing videos or some silly looking drawings, technical drawings, which nobody seems to be able to understand. And there is, for instance, something called the BDA, Comprehensive Development Plan, which looks like a child's coloring map. You know, the people have it's got blue color and yellow and color. Planning. Nobody understands what that means to uh, the so city. planning, spatial planning is... No, no. I'm saying visual representation of planning is required for people to understand. And today with uh, technology and tools, I have been uh, advocating to the government, you know, when people don't realize that there was this fantastic building next to the bank, Vidhan Soda called the Bangalore Press, which was an industrial building with large spans and fantastic light. At the SM Krishna government that time, I had gone and said, this is a God-given press wanted to move out. And I said, this is a great opportunity to set up a spatial, set up a spatial planning center in the center of the city. And so that, but instead they broke it and no, made a because of I could just right? come in quickly. Mr. Murthy, 
if I, if there's evidence and data available, how much respect do people in government respect evidence-based decision making? I just want to link it, assuming the center is available, etc. Do we have a culture of looking at data evidence to make decisions? Or are they impulsive or somebody feels that this needs to be done and it gets done? So data is a very important component of decision making in government. Very often wrong decisions get taken. One, in the absence of adequate data. Two, in the presence of several conflicting interests in government. Somebody wants something somewhere and somebody wants something else. Somebody wants to give a contract to somebody. These are sometimes, unfortunately, the factors which pull things one way or the other. But where you have a situation that data is available about the pros and cons of a particular proposal in reasonable adequacy, then I think the chances are that even in government, I mean... The, no, but as a commissioner, did you yeah. ever have time with 250 people who are the elected reps of the council and all that stuff outside your door? Yeah. Do you have the time to sit and think pros and cons and various things? Is there, is there uh, any mechanism to even look at options? In, in, indeed, yes. Uh, since you asked a question you know, about my experience, one of the first things I did, and some of you probably are aware of this, was to delegate commissioner's powers to all the deputy commissioners and people below, right down to the assistant executive engineers level, because they are the people who need to see the problems of the people and then respond immediately. They shouldn't be sending things right up to the commissioner. Uh, commissioner. That was the first thing. That freed up a good amount of my time. And as commissioner, I was also fortunate in having time enough to spend with residents' associations. Those days, we had a number of residents' associations. Every now and then in the Mayo Hall, we used to have uh, discussions with residents' associations, which were very, very helpful for us to know, in spite of the administration having been decentralized to ascent administratively. I mean, I had given the powers to lower level we functionaries. In spite of that, there were grievances remaining which needed to be voiced by people. You know, we were listening to people and we were able to respond, taking people to task. This kind of a thing is possible. Is it individual driven or systemic? It should be made into a system. Now, it was individual. You see, the, the Bangalore Municipal Corporations Act, you know, the Municipal okay. Corporations Act, says commissioner can delegate his power to any functionary in the administration. And that's can something... Can delegate powers to citizens also? <laughs> well, there is... I mean, citizens really... This is, unfortunately, this is the confusion. People who talk about whether the corporator is doing the work or the officialdom is doing the work. Need to, we need to really be clear about this. What is the role of an elected representative? Is he the competent person to decide who should get contract for doing this or that work? Or is it the mechanism of official or committee mode which will decide what is the right way of doing things? Now, there is confusion between these two. Now, I think very often officials find it convenient to abdicate their responsibility and hand it over to the corporators. And corporators find it very convenient to exercise all the powers and pass on the responsibility to the official town. This we must end. There should be clear separation of In fact, no one, no less a person than Vimal Jalan wrote a book in which he clearly advocates this. There needs to be a clear demarcation of the roles of politicians, roles of civil servants. You know, legend, legend has it, you don't know where the corporator begins, where the contract exactly. joins and where the... Where exactly. The can, can so, we, we need to start fixing things in the system from there. And, of course, changing the uh, location of Capital. Bangalore to Davangere or Delhi to Nagpur. These are things which we can keep talking about, but nothing will happen. But this also points another thing. Sorry to disagree with you. This doesn't say much about our political leaders, our administration, or our ability to get our people to be accountable. If you have to take the capital away from Bangalore to get Bangalore governed properly, what does it say about us? Is Belgaum being governed properly? Is Bellari being governed properly? We don't know. I don't think, uh, you know, merely by shifting political center you will do anything. 
but you need to re redesign the system so that it responds to citizens' requirements and it acts quickly and it gets the resources that it needs. Very often we don't have the resources. So it is possible to do that to a certain extent. The report that your group came up with addresses a number of these questions and it is possible as a basis for discussion that report is good. We need to fine tune it and come up with a structure which, as I said, is effective, at the same time responsive. Thank you. Uh, Meera, bringing you in here as Citizen Matters, you know, you've done, been in citizen-based civic journalism, what, it's over 10 years now? Yeah. And you have had a lot of experience. Uh, so, have you seen the kind of journalism that you've done? I know citizens, a lot of them love it and it's a major source of information. Has, have you seen examples of it informing policy decision-making? Have you seen example? For example, I specifically remember you wrote a, on chikungunya and dengue. You did a deeply researched report saying that the BBMP statistic shows 700 cases, and you establish it's 1 lakh 25,000 cases or something of that magnitude. Did that kind of civic journalism that you did? What impact does it have, and whom does it inform? Does it inform all the citizen groups to take that as a thing? Or do policymakers look at it and some kind of change? What's been your experience as someone in this space? So it is. Yeah, yes. Yeah, it's not just the story. Yeah. 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 Or take that. So it's not just the story itself that uh, you know has impact by itself, but it, when it's taken by citizens, when they engage with it, share their own experiences, and it goes back and forth, and then. That feeds into policy. For example, all this coverage when citizens started, you know, segregating at home, right? It was started by citizens. Even though BBMP came up with some seven-way segregation, nothing happened. Then a bunch of uh, citizens said, okay, let's try this three-way segregation here in this apartment, spread from one to another. And that spread and that story got documented, the successes, the failures, all of that. And... People started doing it because, again, the cost of disposing waste, right? And that eventually kind of informed policy. So the municipal solid waste management rule eventually adopted a three-way system and it went into Niti Aayog. All of this happened over time and because of the citizen activism. And our job is to just be a catalyst in kind of uh, that information exchange. You also have experience in running an open data platform. Right, Can you open just city. share an uh, open city data? So there's open city... Uh, how easy has it been to get government data to be able to put it out there for people to work with? What's been your experience? Very, very hard. You have to kind of, you know, scrounge and scrape and one day the data will be there on some site, quickly download it because the next day it disappears. So we keep doing that and that's how we collected a lot of data and then you try to, uh, you know, convert from PDF into open formats and that. Just looking at the data, you will uncover a lot of things, you know, from ghost workers and Parakarmika lists to non-existent roads in the master plan. So there are a lot of things if one would just care to look. It's all out there. So, Soumya, uh, you know, people say that government must learn to be an enabler rather than the 800-pound gorilla in the center of our lives. Now, does government get what it means to be an enabler and maybe facilitate uh, whether it be transport data, etc. We keep talking about, because the reality is if all this data was made available, there are enough app developers and techies who can use this open source data and build apps which are citizen friendly and usable. Why are we desisting in putting, why does government inherently uh, abhor transparency and openness and prefers opaqueness? I find Mr. Sinhas Murthy has picked up the mic, but first Soumya yeah. and then Mr. Murthy. <laughs> Um, I don't know, sir. I mean, I disagree in the sense, uh, I think we're definitely going towards transparency. I mean, I agree, we have a long way to go. Um, I mean, in the sense, yes, I mean, there have been a lot of issues. Um, but I think, I mean, but I think in the future, we have to move towards um, sharing more data. And, and I think the key is also participatory governance. For example, I mean, it could be, um, for example, just a few people uh, like uh, Meera was actually saying, um, in fact, Bangalore is one of the uh, places where citizens' movement has actually been really extremely active. And in fact, they've had a, a huge role to play in uh, policy. 
or could or it could be even uh, for example since i think december um december 17 2017 when the i mean of course the high court said it segregation was made mandatory but i think this was started actually because of citizens i think lakes and is I, another area in bangalore lakes yes. the citizen movement have been very strong yes absolutely and i think given i mean even tender show i mean that is that was also a really uh, good idea and the government was um, that came, uh, but i think that also involved experts and citizens and everything and and i think we are definitely i think probably the elephant in the room that we are not talking about is also probably population um i mean i was in berlin last month we actually got an award it's actually i mean this is actually another what, example what did we get an award for well um in the kormangla waste processing unit in fact uh, i uh, and of course my father is mla over there so we worked you know but the segregation level was probably about 60% and uh, in fact i went in the morning along with all the citizens and the sourcing we were able to get the segregation levels up to 90% and uh, so the resident uh, and the association they actually came and requested the mla to actually do a waste processing unit which will convert it to biogas and uh, composting unit and he immediately agreed within a few months and last year in february um uh, it be reopened in fact they're using the biogas for uh, in a restaurant close by and the award was called as better together award better together as in when uh, citizens elected representatives and could be innovators join hands you actually able to make things happen and this is actually a very good example of how we when we it is give and take right there there's, there's another jury headed our way which scares the hell out of me we apparently have been shortlisted as one of the top 2 cities in the world with design sensibilities <laughs> in the city i think i don't know this caracas and i forget the other city we are the final two cities and a jury is going to travel down to bangalore to see how well it is designed to see whether we win or the other city wins that's just as an aside so i think Even, <laughs> probably <laughs> bangalore you know if you think about it we were never meant to grow so big 15 years and so ago. quickly and so quickly yes and so quickly i think most of the problems that we are having in our city is actually because of the rate at which migration and infrastructure didn't happen parallel right and that's exactly why we're having a huge toll on everything it could be roads but do we have the capacity in the system to fix it okay it's happened growth has happened growth is happening migration is happening do you believe we have what it takes to fix this place honest answer <laughs> i think everybody i think all stakeholders um i mean it is possible it's not that it's not possible but it will need a collaborative approach I yes think. that's that's exactly what i was saying it, all stakeholders need to sit and come on the same page and work together then it's definitely possible and i think sorry sorry you know you finish it you finish it and i think we also need to move towards sustainability in the sense it's not just a reaction to things that we constantly do every day right when some issue happens so not a quote you can put on mr multi uh, about the point you wanted to make then i want to go to andreas and then the audience yes. uh, the point was why is government so uh, you know so much against disclosing things yeah transparency transparency that's the question i think you know um, this my perspective on this government often doesn't have much to disclose what it has is not very difficult to discover <laughs> you know very often people make announcements because there is this compulsive urge among our people to go to the press the moment they have even got some kind of an idea you know ravichandra comes and tells me something oh i like it so immediately i must have a press conference and say that i am going to do this to tomorrow make the announcement and there will be 50 other citizens groups which will oppose this idea for reasons of their own now the right way to do a do these things is you have an idea you commission a study get some reasonable uh, you know data about what are the pros and cons of something no development can be done without making some sacrifice there will always be something negative there will always be something positive put those things together then go to the public and say that this is the project we have this is the problem we have and this is the solution and these are the costs and we would like 
informed citizenry to give us feedback your comments wait for 15 days one month and then have a public hearing if necessary and then make a decision after weighing the pros and cons of everything don't rush to make announcements whether it is linganwaki water whether it is uh, you know steel uh, over bridge or uh, whatever corridor unfortunately the citizenry also doesn't have the data to oppose it scientifically because they just go by their gut feeling and say oh this can't be done you are destroying this destroying that both sides must exercise because these are problems which will be solved maybe once in hundreds of years so we need to have patience we need to allow time to the government to examine these things we need to allow citizenry to absorb the implications of what is being discussed and then come to a decision you need not be rushing to make decisions rushing to announce rushing to oppose But on disclosure, I just want to mention, uh, just as an example, and Swami, there's something you must take to the corridors of power. One asked a former Supreme Court Chief Justice that if the government put out all the, you know, he spoke about a spatial center. If the government put out all the maps on the net and the commons ex- uh, shown clearly, lakes, buffer zones, parks, etc., then the citizenry will protect it because they know where the commons are. And I asked him if the government did this. will it cut court cases he said it will we can solve most things within a month on these kind of issues you would just need a friend of the court to justify whether the facts are right and with that record available of the commons publicly it is possible and citizens will protect it i think meera wants to say something on the same issue it's an idea worth championing somia i i i mean in, in terms of and you also make want to make a point because if you want transparency the commons is the best place to start because it's public property put it out there trust me the citizens will protect it meera and then naresh and then we go to the audience no, i just wanted to point out this whole issue of land and uh, encroachment and all this is what feeds the political economy until we fix that problem how people get elected and what they elect get elected for people's perception see the reason you talk about decentralization everybody wants to be a corporator not just the mla but also the mp because you want to be you want to nurture your constituency you want to be feel wanted saying oh i fixed this problem i gave you a skywalk i gave you a and, uh, and you know, if proof be noted i think it was the kolar mp who is refusing to give up his corporator seat so if proof be needed of mp and corporator we have it in that individual uh, narish nothing and then we go to the audience Oh, sorry, Andreas. I'm sorry. Thank you for reminding me. Hello, Andreas. You've been very quiet, and I've forgotten. Sorry, sorry. One of the uh, major issues. I don't know. Again, I'm not an expert on other cities, but one of the major issues hassling the state today, particularly this city, is the sheer multiplicity of agencies which are mucking around with this city. There are like, you know, in the last count, there are close to 36 of them by who directly have something to do. with the city the interesting part is not even one of them talk to the other right everybody is sitting with the data silo right and uh, like uh, mr shrinivas murthy is been in multiple positions and i see other people from government also in the audience um, from uh, earlier in the government i cannot understand how an electricity department can function without talking to the bbmp how the bbmp can talk work without talking to the bda the bda works without talking to the bmtc and we somehow magically and whereas i give full credence to what you in the patel committee have said in terms of decentralization one of the gaps in that report is the idea of how are we going to deal with this para status because para st- you have not read the report that no, is no, one second greater bangalore authority no, no, i understand but i'm saying that <laughs> till the para status of the state have also political representation and the sense that like why do we have a bws yeah, they do have they have chairmen who are political yeah but they're they're mostly there as figurative people right in the water supply board is it bescom was struggling i'm not saying it's not struggling now when it was kb there was a lot of invisibility as to what was going on once it has become bescom at least it has an obligation to report what it does i'm not saying it's doing a great job right now but the point is at least there is a physical report in the domain when is the last time anybody has seen a report of the bwssb functioning in this I, so I, we have I, to I, corporate i mean I, i don't want to use the word corporatize but 
we have to bring in corporate accountability standards to parastatals and parastatals have to be subservient to the planning authority if that is not there this is going to, you know the classic example of that and i just want to end here is the lakes of bangalore right? we keep saying lakes is a great success the lakes are not the problem the the storm water drain which runs into the lake which brings the sewage into the lake is the problem the storm water drain the word storm water drain means it's meant to carry storm water it is owned by the bbmp instead the bwssb does not do its job and let sewage into it and the sewage flows along the thing and goes into the lake and wonder of wonders the lake is controlled by the minor irrigation department now everybody in the whole chain of events says oh it's not my problem it's somebody else's problem it's really dysfunctional that point so, is taken no no I'm, no no i just want to close by saying that If there's no point talking about governance structures and how to fix the city unless we have a stream of accountability it's not individual accountability that matters it literally in this in this lake system unless we fix the blasted storm water drain no amount of sewage treatment plants or magic powders somebody yesterday came and said if you pour some magic powder into belandur lake the water will become clean it's never going to change and also the collective accountability andres i want to come to you the uh, the collective accountability is a huge challenge that needs to get fixed andreas you spoke to people across the country and you got some pretty heavy weights so talking on video what is the sense you got a sense that of optimism that there is a solution and it can be done and all, of course the citizen group was very optimistic it can be built ground up what's the end sense you got about the future uh it was generally optimistic um and that's because you know apps like you know the Ainagri. Ainagri, for example it does offer a lot of opportunities and it's it offers a very simple opportunity like i was uh, last year i was at the future of policing in delhi and there for example the whole police department was basically complaining that they never get a phone call from urban planners to basically consult on the way that the roads are supposed to be built and then when the roads are built they just keep on collecting bodies every week at the same corner <laughs> because people get hit by a car for example so with an app like that you can basically create connections below the corporate corporator level before shit hits the fan to 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 say it bluntly and all those that line of accountability that you're talking about can be pushed further by agreeing on what the actual data says and then when the interests come in that's a different story but the opportunities that this can cause are pretty a pretty pretty positive so, so actually so what i hear you say it's going to come ground up from active citizenry etc that's a sense i get of what you're saying yeah because the data doesn't need to be disclosed it's a whole peer to peer system where everybody can basically see digitally what's wrong and then i ask them also for example so basically you're going to document the stuff that most indians already know like this street is unwalkable this street yeah but they said that's not what it's about it's about the fact that it's evidence because otherwise they keep on saying yeah but that's his uh, responsibility that's his responsibility and in this way they can also decide what the demand is for led street lights for example how many times they have to be maintained it's a constant cycle of you know information that keeps on updating all the departments and crowdsourced and, and crowdsourced and everybody can see it so it's not about asking for that transparency it's just creating that transparency transparency by default okay i uh, will go to questions i think sridhar's hand has gone up i need one or two for low hanging fruit uh if uh, of the 30 alphabet soups that are governing bangalore uh If if at all can we try and attempt to say how many buildings are there in Bangalore or how many dwelling units are there in Bangalore and how many streets are in Bangalore and with what characteristics how wide you know walkable etc etc uh, how long will it take for us to come together and make Bangalore better together right I mean is it a three month exercise is it a one year exercise I mean what's what's the feeling I mean where do we start and can this be a low hanging fruit that we can build over right except for the visual i mean the physical the, the actual on ground we know exactly 
I mean, the corporation, BBMP has uh, organized surveys of Bangalore four times over the past 20 years. Unfortunately, it's all on little hard disk somewhere inside BBMP and nobody else is allowed to touch it. Right? And they have road data up to five feet width. I have seen data of the old city where streets of five feet are completely mapped. When you ask them, they say, no, ISRO has it. ISRO is in charge of it. And really speaking, I mean, Ravi can uh, corroborate, the entire exercise of the decentralization of Bangalore was carried out. Of, you can answer. I'll answer this. Uh, Sridhar, to just let you know, the CDP exercise has one of the most amazing GIS maps ever made. I've looked at, I have access to all of that, but I had no permission to share it with the citizens. No, it has the footprint of every building, footprint. It has estimated area of every building. It could be about 5% wrong. It's all available. Everything that you're seeking is available. Don't say, but the government doesn't want to put that data out. And while I had access to it as somebody in the committee, I have no permission to put it out. So I can't use it. To answer your question, it's available. But the desire to make that available in a manner that can be acted on for decision making is absent in government. The same goes for traffic data. You don't need the BMTC to make an ITS application. You just need BMTC to have APIs that gives access to the data that it has got. And there are enough people. This is how California, I mean San Francisco, London, they just put it out and people are developing apps around it. But we are not doing it. So there is something there that we need to address to fix that. Short follow-up question. Um, Soumya, can we, can we try and get this at least addressed in the Vidhan Sauda, right? I mean, these are two very, very small starting points. We spent about 70 crores building the intelligent transport system and it's neither intelligent nor it's helping the transport system, right? So I think a couple of things, right? I mean, we, we see 3 lakh cars by Uber, Ola and somebody else on our mobile phones. But I can't see where my nearest bus is, right? Sure, I'll be happy to do that. In fact, when I was in Berlin a couple of weeks ago, one one of the other uh, awardees was actually he had won it for they won it for uh, mobility, where they'd actually uh, I mean there was data out there and all the different stakeholders right from it could be Uber, it could be public transportation. They had actually built an app for for uh, commuting, no, and the, they, the strangest thing is totalitarian states like China. And to some extent, I would consider Singapore also a totalitarian. A Singapore is also a totalitarian kind of. Uh, Hundred percent of Shanghai's data, Beijing's data, and Singapore's data is online. To you today, not even to Chinese, to Indians, you, you can access it. I cannot understand with the age of Google Earth, in the age of satellites, which can see one meter resolution. What is the hesitation of government to actually part with data? Uh, you know, to mention, you mentioned Vidhan Sauda, I always used to joke, you know, the entry gate needs to say exit from reality and the exit gate of the Vidhan Sauda needs to say entry into reality. <laughs> you are in an alternate universe there. I would like to say something. No, one second, I'm just coming. Yes, yes please go ahead. Uh, who's got the mic? I thought Vijay and the mic came to you. Uh, it's a just direct answer to his question. So last last Friday we had a workshop here in BIC actually all about uh, all aboard on public transport and there was a person who had developed an app which worked and which showed you every Bangalore bus in real time GPS real time data so you would exactly know where is the bus how long do I need to wait. They then went to the B, uh, BMTC to show the app, and BMTC was surprised that they had access to the data. And so the next thing there was like, uh, deny the access to the data and take the access away from the data. So the app exists, it's just that BMTC need to uh, allow access to the data again, because all the buses have GPS and everything, so it's it's there, it just, it's again, it's a matter of permission, and it was there and functioning. I'm coming on the same subject. I'm worried about being a privatization question. <laughs> Part comment, part question. Um, we talked about um, 3,000 pound gorillas in the room, etc., etc. But I thought two gorillas which were not mentioned was 
rule of law and nobody mentioned the rule of law. A lot of systemic changes and uh, structures on structures and data on data. But uh, I have not yet figured out uh, what is the use of a system if a system can be broken and the rule of law does not apply. Uh, and the second big gorilla, which nobody mentioned, and it was everybody mentioned as a positive, is citizens, citizens, citizens. I am coming to believe that the biggest uh, defaulter of this whole whole society is a citizen who breaks the law, uh, you know, uh, phenomenally. And the question, therefore, is a Somia, is that when will the political class ever actually go out and tell citizens to follow the law rather than saying, if you have broken the law, we will protect you. Encroachments, building violations, etc., etc. Unless you participate in enforcing a rule of law down the line, and of course yourself, I don't see how any system can work. Muni, just take the mic. Yeah. Uh, so, Samia, the question is to you. And I suspect in rule of law, you spoke more about the citizen as being the one who's breaking the law, or are you also dealing with enforcement issues? Both. Both. Um, I had some experience of breaking these buildings. Sorry uh, if I am, you know, preempting your answer. Every time we had to break an illegal building, we had to, all our team will had to, had to keep our uh, telephone switched off because we did not want any instructions to be sent to us because early in the morning we would send our, uh, you know, officers and the uh, laborers who had to do the breaking. Uh, you know, it is very difficult to identify one building, get legal clearance for doing that because a number of uh, judicial interventions, stay orders, etc., etc. After that, if we had to do that, we had to do this. I mean, so uh, if if we ever have a day when the elected representatives also stand side by side in enforcing law like this, unpleasant task as it is, it will be a great day. I mean, I, I hope uh, uh, Ms. Saumya's generation of uh, representatives would get that message and uh, stand side by side with people, you know, to, to enforce law. If that happens, that will be great. But before that, all that people in charge of administration can expect is at least don't come in the way of our doing this. And I personally know of any number of cases of building violations, complaints being repeatedly made and um, the administration not being able to respond because there are people preventing them from and, and, and I, I won't name any particular level, all kinds of levels happen this. So this is the problem that we have. The earlier point I wanted to make was about the data being shared. You know, BMTC should have no problem in sharing that with anybody, except that they are not probably, I was also once a BMTC director, I have operated KSRTC fleet, BMTC fleet at one point of time. Things have become so difficult for them that they are not able to respond adequately to demands. You know, so, but sooner or later they should give up this fear, put everything in public domain, and they should be ready to receive these demands. Lastly, the citizens' inputs about what is wrong on the roadside or on the footpath or something else, all these complaints, most useful. You remember in the BATF days, we used to have an app not an app those days, SMS being received in one centralized place by an agency of wherever there is some uh, dump of you know garbage, they would send an SMS and immediately somebody would be rushing there and getting it cleared and then posting it that we have actually done this and we have cleared this particular thing. That's useful. But let me ask you, is it not Possible for an engineer to know where the road is damaged for weeks, months, years? They know. 
this somehow we we have completely neutralized this particular engineer i have personally i mean as a citizen now after retirement taken engineers around the road and said look at this you will be hauled up by some court when somebody uh, falls into this drain please wake up they are unable to do so and that is where we need to start with redesigning this system of how uh, city is governed rather than only thinking of apps to send the information of course that's useful i'm not saying that is not useful so and, and uh, quickly on the rule of law i just want to make one other statement you know I, recently there was a thing somebody you know there's a court order saying you must shut down these establishments etc and the officer was told you'll be in contempt of court if you don't do it so he said what will happen if i do contempt of court they said you may go to jail he said i don't mind going to papanagar or jail i'm more worried about contempt of mla and the corporator than the contempt of court so that's the state we have come to that the court order itself doesn't fear them any more i mean they don't fear that is another thing shivatsa i'll come to you next murli quickly your question and then shivatsa yeah the lady just mentioned about uh, the bmtc's uh, tracking of the buses or services etc in 2006 there was a service called yelli dira of all the volvo buses there were over 40 of them or something like that and the on the yes that's those times it was sms we could track off all of those buses i used to use them regularly and track the buses and go to city court and come back all on bmtc buses volvo buses that was there and for various reasons i won't go into that i mean it was dumped by bmtc mm, i will i don't like to use the word but there is a mafia operation there they didn't want it thing and it it was dumped i am talking about 2006 and i will now come to the other this thing uh, see the talked about low hanging fruit even lower hanging fruit is the you know the power supply okay sir you were in the kerc so you know that see what i am talking about as decades back the karnataka government had decided that uh, you know power the the supply should be privatized okay decades back it was until about 2 years back it was there on your website and uh, subsequently they removed it okay that it was you know this talk about the decision that the government had taken now karnataka government had taken that decision in, i think in 19 before 2000 2002 the delhi government i mean uh, uh, madam shila dikshit took the took the decision so and today point, the, today the transformation in delhi power supply it is 100% a uh, reliable grid power supply as compared to what it is and even the tariff is much lesser than what it is in bangalore so that's a low hanging fruit which we should be adopting straight away the be best part of it is even arvind kejriwal is most happy about it that is okay so with privatization okay. now i don't know what we are waiting for thank you that's it so we we spoke about a lot of things but one of the most important things that we have been spoken about which i feel is the biggest gorilla in the uh, whole debate is the quality of elected representatives themselves so it all starts from there if you want to fix indian cities then you need to elect better corporators better mlas and better mps without that i mean you can go on you can blame now he was talking about why its was not so it's a simple thing i'm i'm sure if the chief minister just picks up the phone and tells the bmtc just share the data it will be done but it's not happening so next year we have the bbmp elections coming up i think people who are sitting here people who are knowledgeable informed citizenry people in power also one of the major things that we have to do is ensure that in the bbmp elections we fight over agendas which will improve the city instead of again going back into useless issues which are or of no use so that is one of the major things that all of you sitting there and including me i am i'm i'm also a politician so we 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 have to fight that so shivatsa my answer on that and on that, on that note we are going to close this evening because we also believe in closing on time you know you will get a better quality of elected reps people standing for thing if you empower the third tier of city government jawalal nehru rajendra prasad bos raja ji sardar patel all five of them 
were either mayors or chairperson of the municipal corporations. They started their life in city politics, town politics, went to state and national. Sorry, you want to say something immediately? Yeah, so that, that itself proves. So let's say, let's tell the people of Bangalore that next year, for, let, let's get 50 corporators demanding an elected mayor. Yeah, so it's not only just the elect, one is elected mayor, but unless you change the governance structure, which incentivizes and has power at the third tier of the corporator level, you are not going to get better people to stand for that position. And therefore, it gets occupied by what you said of the quality. It goes to the point Mr. Srinivasmithi mentioned, that unless you have an overhaul of how you look at this whole thing, just saying I will stand on issues, I have a feeling anybody who stands on issues is unlikely to get elected. Only somebody who can work the system and has the patronage will get elected. Because that's the incentive structure currently. So it's a bit more complex than just fighting the next election on issue based and happening. Many parts have to come together. I think we'll have to... So, okay, everybody, okay, well, let me do one thing. Everybody gets one line, last line, and we close. So, Naresh, and ask me two, three seconds. The person who becomes the mayor of Bangalore, an elected mayor, is the next chief minister of Karnataka. Right? This is the tradition all over the world, everywhere. And today, with dynastic politics, I think the only way out, dynastic politics becoming the norm, I think the only way out to somebody to become an elected mayor of Bangalore is the son or daughter of an existing MLA or an MP. Otherwise, it's never going to happen. So, so because just, a person who is coming out of... And it's a powerful position. People are, all over the world, this is the problem. And if that doesn't happen... right? No, that may be in the Western societies. But in India, it's very difficult for the existing MLAs and the powers that govern the state to actually trust somebody you know that if you go and put an elected mayor there, that person is going to become the next minister, chief minister or the at least. Yeah, the so I'm saying that maybe that's one way out. I will be less cynical than that. <laughs> well, uh, you see, uh, you will have a good mayor or a good set of corporators, good MLAs, when people like this are ready to contest elections. One of them is ready to contest. Yes, uh, that's probably not enough. So you mentioned the example of Jawaharlal Nehru and other people. How many, how many barristers, how many barristers, those days, barristers were ready to contest municipal elections. Now, how many of the IT magnates here, how many of the high-ranking professionals, high-network people, how many of them are ready to contest elections? We are, well, well, I won't comment on that. Uh, last words, Meera. Last words, yeah. Swami. So, uh, I'm not clear why we are talking about politicians and people. End of the day, it's a democracy. Yatha praja, tatha raja. So, it is just a reflection of the larger society, not necessarily an elite group sitting at BIC, but it is the largest. That is how we are. So, uh, you know, expecting people to vote for better candidates as in like there are examples of well qualified candidates who have lost. At corporate level, at MLA level, at MP level. Even so, the IT, IT tycoons have lost. All exactly. Them. So I think it's a you know we have to look within ourselves and look at the larger citizenry also like uh, uh, Vijayan pointed out. So my last words. Uh, I mean, I completely agree. I mean, I was one of those people who was like super critical of politicians and politics and. But then been there, done that. Having been an activist for fifteen years, that's when I decided. Okay, I mean. You need to get into it and do something about it. And I was one of those people who contested. Yes, I completely agree. Sir. I mean, of course, without uh, you know being related to my father, I think I may not have been uh, you know. And I think probably the I mean that's a bigger question that we really need to discuss, right? In the sense, um, I agree with you know Mira as well. In the sense, I mean, there are so many issues right now, right from you know uh, different. Agencies even talking to each other. I have a meeting with all my PWSs, BBBMP, everybody every Monday. And after attending to like half the, I mean, half the time is actually when they, they're like, Madam, please tell them that this, please tell them. I'm like, this is exactly why, because they are not talking to each other. Imagine at a constituency level itself, and even rule of law. I mean, I don't know what others, but I know I definitely am. 
In fact, I myself have to really switch off the phone or I have to put the phone down and say, I am the MLA. If even if I even if you get the even if you get a call from Prime Minister tomorrow, you're not supposed to break that house down. <laughs> and and unfortunately that's how it is. And I mean I can go on and on and on. But I can't talk about most things with my mic on. I mean I'm happy to talk about it offline. <laughs> Andreas, as the filmmaker and the reason for getting all of us together here on a day, India is playing a cricket match. Last words. Um, I think uh, the elected mayor should definitely be in the CEO spheres. Um, I think that there are so many startups and so many young, you know, aspiring, highly educated Indians in Bangalore right now that the only difference from now and the future is that most people, depending on certain generations, are used to now. But I don't think that these uh, patienceless young Indians can, you know, can deal with the system the way it is now. So it has to happen sooner or later, but it just needs that critical mass. You need that, you know, that substantial middle class that just says, listen, we can't have a person who knows less than me be in charge of the city, basically. That's what I feel. Uh, thank, thank you, Andres. On that note, uh, thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience.